You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by m Bank, your partner in Possible. Another episode of Booth Review presented by m Bank. You can open an account with m Bank in less than five minutes. The savings just start there, though. m is a trusted partner with a variety of products and services to help you achieve your goals. Don't be tethered to a brick building. Start a meaningful relationship with a bank that has your best in mind. That's m Bank. Member FDIC. I'm grateful for my meaningful relationship with Scott Chasen. Find him on Twitter at Chasen Scott. Scott, hello. How are you? How are we doing today? I'm doing well. Ken, I think we're Ken underscore Swanson. I think we're both uh, playing a little bit hurt today. Um, look, both Ken and I are, are getting over some sickness. I won't say who's being the better, bigger warrior being here, but all I want to say is I had to take a couple days off work. So mm. um, I, 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 look, I, we're both very dedicated. We got a ton to talk about, especially Kent. You weren't on our post game show, um, but first, I, I don't know if you saw this. Lance Lightpool is getting a little spicy. Have you, you seen this? You watched his last press conference. I thought I, he was a little spicy. I haven't watched it yet. So uh, he started off with an injury update. Gave one about quick update on Jalen and Jacoby. Um, oh, that's funny, actually. Not the show, um, but the players. Ah! Um, the ESPN show. That was not intentional, I swear. It was a bad that joke, was, but... That was, that was perfect. It was accidental. Um, and then he was like, I'm not giving any more updates. And then he got asked about it, about Lonnie, um, because Ace reporter uh, Lonnie Phelps Sr. revealed that uh, Lonnie Phelps Jr. Uh, had an injury. And he was like, "Why? come on, I told you not to ask me about this, which... Just like a quick aside, that's not how press conferences work. Like he could just say no comment that it's totally his right to do that, but he doesn't, you, you don't get to control what questions reporters ask you. This is a, a D1 college football program. Let's be adults here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Kent, it's interesting. Um, you know, allegedly on Twitter, if you saw, um, there's a guy, a KU super fan, Bryson Stricker, for people who aren't on the social medias, who says he's a limited participant at practice. I don't live in Lawrence or I'd, Drive out, get some binoculars going, and see what was going on there. Um, did yeah, someone at OU really do that? A uh, student media did. I mean, look, I've done it before. I, I think people have done it. You know, OU actually has open basketball practices, or they used to under Lon Kruger. But injuries to Jalen Daniels, Lonnie Phelps, Kobe Bryant, Daniel Hyshaw. Injuries have kind of destroyed this team, which is still one week away from a bye week. I guess beyond Jalen, which of those injuries do you think it may be most significant? And wh- who who does KU need back right now? Um, I think you know, Lonnie Phelps is a pretty big one, man. Like, I think he's been the guy that's been the most consistent pass rusher. Like, I think KU's done some pretty good job manufacturing from some pressure, attacking protections, which is a phrase that you'll hear a lot of. Is you know, manipulating the protections that you're kind of anticipating from the offense to try to generate some pressure. I think they've been pretty good and timely with some of that. But Lonnie Phelps is the guy with the most juice off juice off the edge for this football team. And, um, you know, I think he's a guy that, you know, you you want available, especially considering in the aggregate of of that issue. Think about Craig Young. You have to you have to rush Craig Young off the edge a little bit more if you can't get some juice from Lonnie Phelps. So um, if Lonnie Phelps is missing some time, I think that's a pretty, pretty significant one. It always starts up front for me, especially in college football. I think that's why you've seen KU make such great improvement is the depth up front on the defensive line. And Lonnie Phelps is one of those guys that's an impact player for that group. Yeah, for, for Lonnie Phelps to only play 15 snaps, I think that that's what it was against Oklahoma and really wasn't on the field early in that game. I think it, it took a few drives. Maybe he was there for the first drive, but it, it maybe I think it took a few drives um, if I'm remembering right, for him to even start to get involved, I think that's a huge deal. I, I mean, Lonnie Phelps, whether or not, I mean, we've talked about this and you kind of mentioned it with like attacking protections, but like w- whether or not he's getting the sacks, he is dictating everything the other team does defensively. And especially in a game where the offense isn't subbing and giving the defense time to sub, right? Like Oklahoma kept its same guys as they marched down the field. Okay, well then you want your best players defending that, and to not have that guy, I think is a huge deal. Um, I will say, I, I'm really interested to see how teams attack this KU offense the rest of the year, because Oklahoma tempo, getting the ball out quick, 
I, I can I think we'd agree. KU will let you do that. Um, I, I would say Jacoby Bryant is really the one guy you don't want to try and, and get him on like a quick timing thing just because he'll he's most likely to maybe jump that route and try and pick off the ball beyond him. And especially with him out, we don't yet know how long that's going to be. Um, you can take advantage of that cushion that KU is giving you and, and kind of almost like playing catch a little bit, just like, all right, you run something shallow, get some shallow crossers or something. We'll throw it underneath and we'll do it over and over and over. Uh, now I think it's the KU defense's turn to adjust and, yeah, I mean, they need Lonnie back in a bad way. I, I think they need Kobe Bryant back in a bad way just because of that big play potential. Um, they need some help there because right now I, I see a unit that, um, you know, maybe it'll, it, it definitely will look better than it looked last week. But when you start missing key guys on that defense and, and if other teams keep up with that tempo, I think it will cause them problems. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I'm a little torn on adjusting away from what this team has done to this point, even though Tempo absolutely destroyed them. And here's why. I don't think that, I mean, I know Dylan Gabriel's not lining up over against against KU's defense the rest of the season. Like, they're not going to see him anymore. And, I mean, unless they make the Big 12 championship, am I right? <laughs> um, that's still probably not happening. But I, I think... Like it, it, philosophically, I don't have a problem with how this defense is structurally built, and I don't have a problem entirely with how they handled the tempo stuff. Um, it is very tricky, and it's a nightmare matchup for them to deal with the kind of tempo that they dealt with with Oklahoma a lightning, blazing speed, ball getting out of their hands quickly. And yes, I, I, I mean, I understand that's part of KU's, un, you know, KU's undoing was giving up soft underneath stuff, but. Forcing consistent drives has been something that this team has been doing for the entirety of the season. Forcing and, and reducing explosive plays as best as they possibly can to give themselves as many bites at the apple uh, for the other team to make a mistake, to make a key turnover. Um, and, I mean, that's a credit to Oklahoma for not getting behind the sticks ever. Uh, tempo destroyed yeah. Kansas. Don't get me wrong. Like temp Tempo destroyed Kansas. And it's a horrific nightmare for this team because I do think that if you can get in a rhythm offensively, the talent starts showing up a little bit more when you go with that tempo. Um, and KU's not the most talented team in the Big 12. I don't think I, I don't think that's breaking news. But um, I think, you know, structurally, I don't mind the approach. It's just it was a horrific perfect storm nightmare for the Kansas defense this week where, I mean, I don't think you just abandon everything that you've been doing to this point in the season. I just think you've got to, you know, you, you got to be willing and you, you got to be, you got to be ready for it maybe a little bit better. And they, they probably are now they've seen the best. I think the, the team that can play tempo the best in the big 12 was Oklahoma. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you, um, why do you, why do you think it was that Oklahoma just had so much success? Because like, I think in, in these games, there's been at least like a foothold that KU could find and say, you know, you're not going to do X, even if that offense is still scoring a lot. And and that's why, like, you know, when I talk about situational defense and, and you go back to that West Virginia game, well, at least when KU got to halftime, they came out and they found something that worked. They were able to kind of uh, eliminate, first of all, the mistakes that they made in the first half and then, you know, make it a little bit harder on West Virginia. It's where they actually got a few stops. Um, same thing, even against TCU, I think TCU had three or four drives before they even got their first touchdown, where even though they did score points, it felt like there was that consistent stretch. I, I mean, there just wasn't that consistent stretch. There were a few drives, but I would argue those drives were like, oh, you shooting itself in the foot when you consider, I mean, Dylan Gabriel tried to like cross over on an option, like with a football and just dropped it. And then the interception he had at Kenny Logan, I, I didn't think, I mean, I could be wrong. I didn't think KU did anything like special to get that interception. So I, I, yeah, I guess, why do you think it was that way against Oklahoma? Well, I think, I think Dylan Gabriel is awesome. And mm. I, I actually think Dylan Gabriel is really good. I think that's part of it for me. And, and it, maybe he's not good week in week out, but you got good Dylan Gabriel this week. And you know, he is uniquely capable and he was uniquely capable of picking on the offense off coverage because you were seeing the ball getting out of his hands so quickly. I mean, they were taking the short stuff. <laughs> KU didn't do a great job tackling, I think, which was playing into and it got worse as the tempo started hitting a little bit more. Um, but I, I, I think I think you, a little bit of this is tipping your cap, cap to Dale and Gabriel, honestly, because I don't you know, Hunter Deckers isn't doing that. Hunter, Hunter Deckers didn't do that. 
for instance. Yeah. I'm not trying. We just we, this is the duck the Hunter Decker's hate hate podcast, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, it's it's true though. It's just like I think he's uniquely capable of creating problems for this team the way he gets the ball out of his hands and what KU is willing to sacrifice to kind of try to you know you know get stops. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, Scott. You know, you talk about hey, Kansas didn't inflict too many mistakes. That's part of their MO, I think. I don't mm -hmm. I think part of their MO is not necessarily we're gonna out talent you. We're going to just be elite at turning the ball over because we have a bunch of ball hawks that are gonna be make like make a bunch of plays on the football. I think that their MO is we're gonna make you be consistent up and down the field and we're gonna make you make the mistake. And oh, you didn't make a ton of mistakes. And yeah, they ran the ball great. They kind of just they got into a, they got into a rhythm that KU couldn't match. The the rhythm that OU was able to kind of just get into into that game was ultimately what 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 put them what what put KU so far behind and behind the sticks is hey once that once that snowball starts it is hard to slow it down because tempo running the football becomes easier tackling becomes harder coverage becomes harder discipline becomes harder i mean they set up that that one of the the, the touchdown that Jacoby Bryant gave up was set up mm -hmm. earlier in the game with the same look only it was a, a hitch route so yeah i don't know it's I was impressed by OU. I think OU responded extremely well. And I'm not beat up about this performance from the KU defense too much to where I just think the sky is falling. Yeah. Well, before we make this too much of the bummer podcast, um, I want to I want to flip over to the offense real quick. Um, maybe it'll be a bummer for a little bit more. I, I, I'm very conflicted with the offense because obviously you score 42 points and you do that with a backup quarterback. And I kind of want to amend something I said earlier. Um I don't think the offense I, clearly wasn't good enough in this game, but I, that's not because I they had to score 56. So that, that's not what I'm saying. Um, I go back to that drive in the first half, that stretch where it was 14-14, you get the fumble. And you don't have to score touchdowns on the next five drives or whatever, but what you can't do is three and out, three and out, interception, three and out. That's four straight drives, three three and outs, one interception. You can't do that. Um, now, that being said, I think there are some opponents you can probably get away with that against, especially if it's not 14-14. Maybe you're up 7-0 or 10-0 or 14-0, and, and maybe you can do that and hang in the game. So maybe this was just a bad case for that. So, you know, I think I, I didn't rewatch the whole game, but I went back and watched a bunch of the key plays, and I, I came away from it. I know we've talked about this, and you've said this. It's like it's never as bad as you thought. It's never as good as you thought. And in this case, even though the offense scored 42, I would put this in the camp of it wasn't as bad as I thought. Because I, I actually thought there were some concepts that they found that could work. Um, I expect this team to continue to have success with its running game. I think Devin Neal um, is primed for a larger role. I want to see Savion Morrison um, have a larger role on this team. I wonder how much they tweak and adjust moving forward with Jason Bean. Um, to me, wouldn't shock me if they go away from the option stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not saying abandon it entirely, but as the game went on, it felt like they did less and less. I don't know how comfortable they are with Jason Bean taking hits. Lance Leipold kind of alluded to that this week. I don't know how comfortable Jason Bean is with fighting for those extra yards, a la Jalen Daniels or Carter Stanley. Um, and I don't know that that you want to make him make 50 different decisions every series. You don't want him going triple option and then thinking about all the reads and, and doing everything and overcomplicating it. You know, Lance Leipold brought up, I think he had two delay of game penalties. And he basically assigned those to Jason Bean. He was asked about Jason Bean's performance. And he said, well, he got two delay of game. Like that's where he went first, which tells you again, some of that, like, Hey, are, are you asking this guy, which I'm not saying this to be disrespectful. He is this team's backup quarterback. Mm -hmm. Are you asking him maybe to do a little bit too much that you could simplify and, and maybe even have better results? I think they put a ton on his plate in this game. And I think they I mean, I, I think that they just they treated it like a regular week. They put everything on his paint plate. They put full trust in him. And you want to know something? I think they earned I, I think Jason Bean, from all indications, has earned that. And I think your, his performance last week earned that, too, if I'm being honest. Like I look at. Yeah. Jason Bean, it was a little bit of sink or swim this week with with the offense and with this game against Oklahoma. They threw everything. Uh, they put everything on his plate. They didn't hold anything back when it came, you know, not saying play calling didn't change, but I'm just saying like, hey, we trust you to get in and out, you know, get get us in and out of these plays, get the ball off on time, protect the football. You know, I think that they just put full trust in Jason Bean and kind of just, you know, let him go out and, and play. And I think th I think he's earned that. 
I think he's mm-hmm. earned that. I, it, by, especially what he did last week. You, he deserved the opportunity to sink or swim. I think he sunk a little bit. You know, I think there was, I think there it was a very up and down performance. I think, you know, that this was a game where, you know, there was plenty of issues and mistakes that kind of kept KU from winning the football game. And it did start at the quarterback position. But at the same time, I, I look at it and I go, uh, KU's sitting here five and two, which is still insane. It's still ridiculous. And they need one more win. I Five more wins would be great. They need one more win. They need one more win. And how are they going to get that win? I mean, maybe Jalen Daniels comes back per Bryson Stricker's report that, you know, he's he's a limited participant in practice today. Maybe he's back sooner than we think. But I think KU needs Jason Bean to win him one game. So it could be, you know, it, it's a little bit of a long play, I think, too, is just to show your confidence, your trust, your belief in this kid because you need him to go out and play above you know, his, I don't want to say above his head, but I think you just, you need him to, like, if he puts up together one really outstanding second half of TCU performance for 60 minutes, that's going to be enough one of these weeks to, to get this team to a bowl. So it was very up and down in the three and outs and stuff. Some of that was him. And I think, you know, the, there's some issues there and some, you know, consistencies that maybe, maybe showed you why Jalen Daniels got the job in the first place. But, I, I think this team is trying to set him up for an opportunity to find one of these wins in the next set, five games. Yeah, well, I, I will say this about Jason Bean, and, and this is to his credit. He is good enough to score 40 points in a shootout. I, I Take this one out of it. Like a true back-and-forth shootout that's actually close, he's good enough to do that and to mm-hmm. keep you in the game and make explosive plays on the ground and through the air, you know, I know the broadcast said he had a bigger arm than Jalen Daniels. He doesn't, but he has a cannon. Um, yeah. And I remember looking at his film in North Texas where um, not comparing him, but you, to these guys, but you see NFL plays where the guy's feet aren't set and he's kind of drifting, drifting, and then just kind of chucks it downfield and the ball goes like 50 yards. He does that. That's on his film. Um, but I, I think sometimes he needs to maybe control it better and not make that kind of throw when the guy's five yards in front of him. But uh, look, he's good enough to be in those situations. I think the concern if you're Kansas is the inconsistency so far he's had two I'm I'm, they're better than not bad, but I'm just going to classify the performances as bad and not bad, which maybe that's the negative way to do it. But for sake of this conversation, you'll, you'll kind of see why I'm putting it that way. He's had two in the not bad camp. And when the not bad combines with not bad from the defense, I think that's absolutely good enough. Um, I think what we're seeing from the defense is more often than not, they've done enough, but I don't know that they've been enough to elevate when the offense has fallen flat, really, other than Iowa State and some of the TCU game, some to most of the TCU game. Um, I felt like the defense did enough when the offense wasn't there to, to allow them to hang around. You need those two things to link up, and I'm still betting on it to happen. I still think this team wins six or seven games. I, I really do. Um but it also wouldn't shock me. You know, all it takes is like two or three bad weeks from Jason Bean, two or three bad weeks from the defense, which is very plausible. And then you go 0-5 and, and you end your season on that losing streak, which I still, that's a later conversation of how we view this team if they do end up losing out. Because again, I don't think that's going to be the case. But I think that's the worry to me at this point would be week to week inconsistency, which I think we've seen a little bit so far. Well, I think that's kind of why I talk about playing above his head just a little bit. Because there are these... I don't. I, I don't want to get uh, too critical of a college kid. I try really hard not to get too critical of college kids because you know. But um, I think there are fatal flaws in how he plays, and I, I think there are moments in the game where some of the kind of lack of touch I think on the football really shows up. I think about the throw out into the flat um, against TCU. Against TCU. Yeah, yeah, Devin Neal, who was wide open right there. Yeah, that would have been a huge uh, opportunity for them to to kind of win that football game. Uh, the interception to the interception in the Oklahoma game, where you know he he if he throws that ball a little bit more layered, I think that ball is an interception. But he's kind of got, <coughs> excuse me, he's kind of got this thing mm-hmm. where you know I, I think he tries to drive the ball a little bit too much, and I don't know if he can really consistently throw the ball with touch where. 
I, I think that's what gets him from time to time. Some inconsistencies with his base at times. I think he gets a little bit out ahead of himself, like you saw when he threw behind uh, his receiver on that mesh play against TCU. He's got to avoid a couple of those. And I, I don't think it's too much to ask for him to avoid a couple of those. Like you're going <laughs> to, they're going to happen. But I think you can, I think you can, I think there's going to be a couple games where he's not going to have that problem. And those are the games that KU's going to be win, or going to win or be right there. I, w- I want to actually add another layer of, of positivity really quick, if you don't mind, Scott. All right, let's get positive. I do mind, actually. We're both sick. Let's be <laughs> as negative as humanly possible, Ken. I did not walk away from that Oklahoma game discouraged at all about the next five games. Mm. I And maybe this is the optimist in me. But I look, I think that was a nightmare matchup for the defense where I don't think that they're just going to give up 52 points the rest of the way out and they're just going to get dominated for the rest of the season. We've seen this team be really good against the run against Big 12 opponents this season. It's not like they just completely forgot how to run, you know, how to stop the run. It's that this was a nightmarish matchup for them to try to navigate. Um, Offensively, they put up 42 points. That's still really impressive. I think that they were closer. You know, I, I think a few things go differently and this team might even put up a few more points. Like I don't think, and again, this team only lost by 10. Like this team last year loses 52 to seven, but this team responded differently. I think even though the score, I mean, yeah, I know it was a late score and all that stuff. I don't care. This team lost by 10. This team wasn't blown out of the water. This team had a lot on their plate to try to deal with and, and they weren't, best equipped to deal with it relative to some of the, you know, th- this isn't a team that's going to do great against tempo. I don't think they're going to get tempo to death for the next five games. I don't think every team's just going to try to do that. They're going to stick to what they're good at and their core principles. And I don't think every team has a quarterback capable of doing what Dylan Gabriel did to that defense. So I feel, I don't feel anything different about this team's outlook. In fact, I like, Hey, I actually kind of feel okay about like this offense's ability to move the football still. And I think they're going to have a lot. Of, they're going to solve problems in, you know, on on the offensive side of the ball. They're going to figure some things out. They've been able to do a variety of different ways throughout the season. I don't have any doubt that they're going to be able to figure it out again. Yeah, that's a little bit of Kent Kotelnicki there. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you're his long lost son, but he has the saying uh, that basically, yeah, look, if other teams want to adjust and play a specific style because they think it works super well against us that's fine they're doing something they don't normally do who do you think is going to execute better the team that's been itself all year or the team that's dramatically changing to stop something and and that's always mm -hmm. that's always been the case with this team like i think that's what Mm -hmm. they are hey we've we're well coached we're gonna be the better coach team i i I think that's kind of their identity like probably not what they're telling the players but hey we're gonna be better disciplined we're gonna execute better than you we're going to turn this we're going to try to restrict this game a little bit it's not going to be about talent we're going to try to not make this game just about talent yeah well let's keep the positive positivity going I, I i want to talk real quick about just positions speaking of the coaching staff that they can put these guys in to succeed um i i think again with jason bean is giving him those opportunities where he can load up and give his receivers a chance to make the play uh kent you were on this before the season I don't think anyone has given enough respect to how good the Kansas wide receivers have been this year. Like the number of tightrope, acrobatic, athletic, insane jump ball catches. Um, I, like shocking is not the right word. It's stunning though. It, it's a synonym for shocking. Um, it, it's They have been so good at making plays when the plays are available. And they're, I, I, I just think the effort level on the outside has really shined through. And you kind of continue to see that. So I think number one is letting those playmakers have those chances to continue to make plays. Like Quentin Skinner. With all due respect to Quentin Skinner, a year and a half ago, who's Quentin Skinner, right? Like no one knows that he's even on the team. Or maybe you do if you're a diehard fan and you've heard his name. Like, oh, this guy, this walk-on is impressing, whatever. But like now he's on scholarship. He's one of the best deep threats in the Big 12. LJ Arnold has blossomed, right? Like LJ Arnold early in his career, Drops were a problem. I'm a problem. He had a few drops in a limited sample. He wasn't able to stay on the field one year. And now all of a sudden he looks pretty good. Luke Grimm, we know what he can do as a route runner. He made an incredibly difficult catch against TCU that, that sort of keeping his feet in um, to get the touchdown. And then you have guys like Tanaka Scott, who's just a long strider and can have that straight line speed 
Um, obviously, Trevor Wilson might be back with this team now or is back with the team, is traveling. We'll see if he has a role. Like, you've got legitimate talent there, and as they use the tight ends more and more, um, along with those receivers, I-, I think it's putting Jason Bean in a position to let those guys make a play. And that's why I talk about simplifying. Like, I don't think they need to, like, erase concepts that they do well, some of which are more complicated than others. But I think finding Jason Bean's comfort level, maybe that's what that's what I'll say better than simplifying. Finding his comfort level, um, Andy Kotelnicki is great about that, asking the players, asking other coaches, what plays do you think work? Um, and I think going to those strengths can really help elevate KU. I think, yeah, I think there's a lot of meat on the bone there looking, and you talked about personnel and adjusting personnel to the strengths of your quarterback. And I think, I think Jason Bean does have some downfield ability and you just got done talking about a lot of guys that can really win down the field. Um, I think the byproduct of the, of KU being able to run the football more consistently or consistently just period throughout the rest of the season could really help add a additional layer of that vertical stretch to this team. So I'm, I'm kind of flipping this talk about receivers into more than Mm -hmm. just that, but I think I, but I, but I think that's, I think if you can in a Jason Bean offense, I think you're running, you're hoping you're running the football effectively. You're reducing the number of times you're just leaning on him in the drop back game. Um, and then, but I think you're trying to dial up some shot plays too. I think you're trying to get points on the board, getting the ball down the field because Jason Bean showed an ability against TCU to do that. Um, that it's in his arsenal. He's got a lot of guys with a lot of vertical stretch ability and, and guys that can win the ball at the catch point. LJ Arnold, I think has been really strong catching the football lately. We talked about Tanaka Scott, like they just, I mean, there was a stretch there where they were just literally putting everybody into the boundary, except for Tanaka Scott and trying to throw a fade to him once a week. Might want to bring something like that back this week. But um, I think if you want to get time to throw and you want to get some of that vertical stretch game going, I do think that that the run game needs to be uh, something that that gets going at a more consistent rate. Um, And I know some people don't agree with the, hey, the the play action versus, you know, do you need to run the ball to, to, to have effective play action? I think it matters. I think some of this stuff matters more in college than it does in the NFL, if I'm being honest. Yeah. And how teams devote to stopping the run, the resources that they devote to stopping the run is a little bit different than what you see in the NFL because the quarterbacks are a lot better at consistently making you pay. I think... You know, there are there are some guys that can play well for Jason Bean. There's some guys that can play to the strengths of Jason Bean. And I do think they've got to they've got to unlock those. But I think they've got to they've got to be better about running the football so they can get some of the explosives going, because I don't think Jason Bean is the guy that you want the way Jalen Daniels has driving consistently. Yeah, well. I'll say this. It's, it's also funny that we've gone from full negativity to now positive outlook, and, and we've really gone full circle in this conversation. I kind of want to end with one one thing that maybe we each can do. Um, maybe each give one shout out to one thing, uh, either that you saw against Oklahoma in the last few weeks, that's just maybe the most promising thing to you. Um, I'll, and I'll give mine just because there was, there was one thing that came to mind, but I wasn't really sure how to fit it in. Um, offensive line and pass blocking. I think KU's offensive line has been a little bit up and down this year, but mostly up, especially comparatively speaking, to what they've had in past years. Um, you're seeing not only Scott Fuchs, Andy Kotel, Nikki, how that staff works together, but Lance Leipold, you're, you're seeing it all. You're seeing that offensive plan come together. Um, it wasn't every time. There were times where Oklahoma got pressure, but the number of clean-ish pockets that Jason Bean had or pockets that were either clean or they had that escape route. They had that one place. Okay, there, there's something happening over here. I can step to my right and I'm fine. Um, I thought that was a huge sign. And I think moving forward, if that continues to be the case, if that line continues to show some growth with giving him time to load up and throw the deep ball, they you know, definitely did it against TCU. I think that's huge for Kansas. I think that's huge for Jason Bean. I think that means at least a couple more wins this year. Because then I think it's almost like you can't fail when you're put in those better positions. So that that to me would just be like my lasting kind of positive shout out from the last game because I thought the number of times where I was like, wow, Jason Bean is getting time and protection. Um, I thought that was really promising. I was blown away. Uh, I've been blown away by this offensive line. And I always point back to the South Dakota game and Lance Leipold's first game here 
and I just look at the growth because this is largely the same guys that were playing there in that offensive line that year. Uh, it's it's remarkable. For me, I want to continue to shout out Craig Young. Um, because like, okay, so like, th- we have conversations with people not on this show about, you know, the, the, the KU defensive philosophy, the 4-3, playing a little bit heavier personnel, uh, being content or intent on stopping the run. And I don't think people... I'm going to continue to bang this drum. I don't, I don't think people realize how big of a unicorn Craig Young is. Like, he is a special, special specimen of a football player. I don't think he's the best player in the world. I don't think he's, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think he's got an NFL future. I genuinely do. I don't know if he's going to be a top 100 pick whenever he decides to move on. But I don't think people understand how valuable it is to have Craig Young on your on your football team, especially for this defense. Because KU is not the most talented football team in the, in, in, in the, in, in college football. They have played to a remarkable level. For a lot of different reasons, they have to do things a little differently. They have to, um, I think they they have to play things a little bit differently. I think Brian Borland will always be intent on stopping the run with this team, but I think they are, are probably focusing on that as much as they are because I think the fickleness of college quarterbacks can put them in situations to win football games and force long drives and force m- mistakes because that's just uh, making college quarterbacks beat you can be a very good strategy. I think Craig Young lets them do anything that they want. And Craig Young is doing about anything on the field that he wants. You know, he gets to he's that third linebacker, he can play as an overhang. He can carry vertically with athletic wide receivers. Oh, and he can rush the passer like Kyron Johnson. He looks yeah. like Kyron Johnson, like longer Kyron Johnson off the edge. <coughs> and I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm uh, a little coffee still, but I've been, I've been, I've been blown away by what they've asked him to do and what he's been able to do. And I hope people understand how rare it is to have a kid like that on your team. I think he changes everything. He'd probably be sneakily the biggest loss on this defense perhaps uh because of of how unique and valuable he is to this team yeah uh, he's played a he's definitely played an important role um and you've highlighted it several times and and it's just i think it's that uh, give the staff credit too for you know when they sit 100%. out and they look for players who could fill roles this is a guy who I, ideally, I mean, fills what Brian Borland's defensive philosophy is and what he asks is kind of, I mean, overhang linebacker. I think that's the best way to describe the position he plays. Um, maybe, maybe it isn't. Maybe like safety linebacker hybrid. I don't know. Um, he fills that so perfectly. It really helps him. All right, real quick. Let's get predictions on this Baylor game. We haven't really talked much about Baylor, but I mean, it's not about Baylor as much as it is this team. And if they can solve some problems and and be, you know, I think that's always going to be the MO, just how that happens. So Scott, give me a prediction for this football game. That's tough. Um, I actually really haven't thought about this one at all. So I'm kind of doing this on the fly. Let's I pick KU to beat OU. That didn't work out for me. I think when I pick against KU, they win. Um, They're undefeated when I pick against them, actually, Uh, I think. So I'll go, hmm. I, I think, I think I, I would, if this were like a series, I'd probably take Baylor to win more games than I think KU would. But I think KU has a, a very real chance to win this game. So I, I'll probably take Baylor like 31-24, something like that. But genuinely, I, I think if Kansas, I, I think B-plus game, Kansas will be there. Um, I, I don't think you need a football from Kansas to win this game. I, I think B plus quality Kansas can be there at the end of the game. I think you're getting a plus football out of Kansas. I think this is going to be one mm-hmm. of their best performances of the year. I don't know why. I just have a feeling uh, if Jason Bean can avoid the key critical mistakes. Um, I think this team's walking out of Waco with a win. I'm actually going to predict it. I just, it's just, this is, this is gut. I just have a gut feel about, you know, I don't think it's, I, again, I don't think, I don't think Oklahoma is a representation of this football team. I don't think they're a bad football team. Um, I'm, I walked away encouraged because they've yet to get the break speed off of them. They've yet to get blown out in a football game. They went to Oklahoma. 
with their backup quarterback for the first time. They got, some, I think, offensively started picking up some confidence. I feel good about this. I I, I feel good about this this football team. I genuinely do. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to pull out a win in Waco. It's going to be tight. It's going to be something like thirty-one to thirty. But I have mm-hmm. KU winning. I have KU winning this game. I think this is where they get their sixth win. Maybe find one or two more during the season, but I think they're going to get that uh, that elusive six win and get themselves extra time with Lance Leipold into December. Yeah, the bye week. The bye week, by the way, before even I know you're talking about the bowl game, but the extra time they're going to get after this game, I think, will be massive for this team. And one other quick note: if you're a KU fan, Baylor, I think it's McLean Stadium. Uh, it's the best stadium in the Big 12. It is absolutely hmm. gorgeous. I It is in a great area with this like little river thing. Highly recommend making that trip down there if you're like on the fence or considering it. It's a, it's a great place to take in a game. And they have pizza for media after the game. So that was always my favorite place to cover. Uh-huh. Okay, I see how it is. You go all the way down to Waco for pizza. Hmm. Yes. Great. <laughs> that, it's more or less the truth. We won't be in Waco. We will be available here after this game, breaking it down live. KU Baylor, check us out on Saturday. That is it for Booth Review. We'll catch you later.